Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, to our friends in Asia, good evening. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this book launch uh, event on the growth and distribution in the digital era. We would have loved to see you in person here at Brookings, uh, but unfortunately, we have to hold this event virtually because of the continuing pandemic. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to convene in person in the near future. Uh, to start, I'd like to thank in particular our colleagues from the Korea Development Institute at KDI who are joining us late in this evening. As you know, it's a 14 hour time difference between Washington and Seoul. Uh, KDI is our valued partner in this work and we greatly appreciate your collaboration and support. Technological change driven by digitization and artificial intelligence is the defining future of our time. It is transforming economies uh, altering growth and distributional dynamics and reshaping public policy agendas. This trend, which was underway before the COVID-19, will likely accelerate in the post-pandemic world. The book we are launching today, Shifting Paradigms, Growth Finance, Jobs and Inequality in the Digital Economy, examines the challenges of digital transformation and suggests how responsive policies can make it more productive and inclusive. This is the second book on the economic implications of technological change produced by the joint research project of Brookings and KDI. The first book, Growth in a Time of Change, Global and Country Perspectives on a New Agenda was published uh, in 2020. Technological change is posing many questions for investors, business leaders, workers, policymakers, such as, is rising market concentration inevitable with new technologies? Or can the benefits in raising productivity be more widely shared across firms? How can the promise of digital innovation and finance be captured while managing the risks? Or should workers fear the new automation? Are technological driven shifts in business and work causing economic inequality to rise? What new challenges arise for public policy in areas such as competition, regulation, workforce development, social protection, and taxation? And what new thinking and adaptations are needed to realign institutions and policy with the digital economy? The book being launched today addresses all these questions. And we are very fortunate indeed to have an excellent group of presenters, moderators, and panelists including many of the book's authors. I'm sure we'll, we are in for a very stimulating discussion. Finally, I would like to thank the leadership of KDI for their support of the joint research project with uh, Brookings, including former president, uh, Jung Choi, uh, former senior vice president and chief research officer, Dong Su Kan, and current president, Jung Wong, as well as the current senior vice president uh, and the chief research officer, Young Sun Ko. I would like to thank Brooking and KDI scholars and the external partners for working with us for the very useful research also that they've produced. The research reflected in the two books provide valuable analysis and policy guidance on some major issues in our time of change. I look forward to continued collaboration with KDI on joint research on harnessing the promise of new technologies in ways that promote broad-based improvements in economic prosperity. KDI President uh, Wong has kindly recorded his remarks for this event in a video that I would like to be played at this time. 안녕하십니까 KDI 원장 홍장표입니다. 먼저 바쁘신 가운데 이른 아침부터 참석해 주신 브루킹스 연구소 브라히마 콜리발리 부원장님께 감사드립니다. 그리고 오늘 사회자로 함께해 주실 세계은행 전방그룹 아이안코세 국장님 조지 워싱턴 대 데니 라이프지크 교수님께도 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 아울러 보고서의 저자와 토론자 그리고 온라인으로 참석해 주신 모든 분들께 깊은 감사의 말씀을 전합니다. 오늘은 글로벌 톱 싱크탱크인 
브루킹스 연구소와 KDI가 새로운 성장 아젠다를 주제로 약 4년에 걸쳐 수행한 공동 연구를 마무리하고 되돌아보는 날입니다. 지난 2020년에 발간한 첫 번째 보고서에서는 기술 발전에 따른 성장 패러다임의 변화와 그 역량을 글로벌 관점에서 살펴보고 정책 방향에 대한 시사점을 제시한 바 있습니다. 이어서 오늘 발간하는 보고서에서는 기술 변화가 생산성, 금융, 노동시장, 불평등에 미치는 영향과 이것이 경제정책 전반에 던지고 있는 함의를 심층적으로 논의하고 있습니다. 지난 2년 동안 코로나19 팬데믹을 겪으면서 세계 모든 사람들이 미정류의 사회경제적 어려움에 직면하고 있습니다. 또한 코로나19 위기는 디지털화와 온택트 시대로의 전환을 가속화시켰습니다. 디지털화가 생산성 향상과 경제성장에 가져온 변화뿐만 아니라 사회적 격차에 미치는 영향도 강화해서는 안 됩니다. 디지털 기반이 약한 사람들은 점차 사회에서 소외되고 정보 격차는 양극화를 더욱 심화시킬 수 있기 때문입니다. 이러한 난제에 대응하고자 한국 정부는 한국판 뉴딜을 선포한 바 있습니다. 디지털 대전환 촉진을 위한 디지털 뉴딜, 저탄소 경제로의 전환을 위한 그린 뉴딜, 그리고 고용사회 안전망 강화를 통한 휴먼 뉴딜을 추진한다는 계획입니다. 이처럼 우리는 코로나19 이후에 대전환기를 맞이하여 전례 없는 대책을 필요로 하고 있습니다. 오늘 발간하는 보고서를 통해 이러한 시대적 과제에 대해 함께 고민하고 시사점을 찾아낼 수 있기를 기대합니다. 마지막으로 대내외 환경 변화에 선제적으로 대응하기 위해서는 KDI 브루킹스 연구소의 공동연구처럼 정책연구의 협업과 융복합 연구가 절실합니다. 앞으로 새로운 어젠다에 대해 추진할 두 기관의 공동연구에 대해서도 많은 관심과 성원을 부탁드립니다. 바쁜 일정과 시차에도 불구하고 오늘 발간에 참석해 주신 모든 분들께 다시 한번 감사의 말씀을 드립니다. 감사합니다. Thank you so much, uh, President uh, Wong, for these uh, thoughtful observations. I would like now to invite Yong Sun Ko, Senior Vice President and Chief Research Officer of KDI, to chair the next session of the event. Uh, over to you, Yong Sun. Good morning. Uh, I am very happy to chair the first session. Uh, because of the time constraint, I will limit, limit myself to introducing uh, the uh, two main authors, uh, Jia Kresh and Chen Sigu, who both of whom uh, worked as the coordinator from the Brooklyn side and KDI side uh, to complete the uh, wonderful uh, publication. So, uh, Jia, will you start? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Yang Sun, uh, for the uh, for the introduction. Uh, as uh, earlier speakers have noted, uh, technological uh, transformation led by digital technologies and uh, artificial intelligence is a defining feature of our time. Uh, the Brookings KDI research project and the uh, two books produced under it examine how this transformation is reshaping economies and uh, public policy agendas. I would like to thank my co-editors, uh, John Sik Wu and Hyun Wook Kim, and our uh, co-authors. The research analyzes the implications of digital transformation uh, from both global and country perspectives, including a specific focus on Korea. In the few minutes that I have, I will highlight some global themes and findings of this research. 
In his presentation that follows, uh, John Sik will highlight findings more specifically uh, from the perspective of the uh, Korean economy. Next slide, please. The new technologies hold great promise. They create new avenues and opportunities for a more prosperous future, but they also pose new challenges. While digital technologies have dazzled with their potential, they have so far not fully delivered the expected dividend in higher productivity. Indeed, productivity growth has slowed in the past couple of decades in many economies. Consequently, economic growth has trended lower. At the same time, income inequality and related disparities have increased, particularly in advanced economies, stoking a social discontent and political ferment. Specific trends differ across countries, but the case of the United States, the global leader in uh, digital transformation, illustrates well the uh, twin trends of uh, slowing productivity growth and rising inequality over the period of uh, digital transformation. As shown in this chart, in the last decade or so, labor productivity growth has averaged less than half the growth rate of the decade prior to the slowdown. The income share of the richest 10%, one measure of inequality, has increased from 35% to 47% since the 1980s. Next slide, please. One important reason for these outcomes is that policies have been slow to adjust to the unfolding transformations. As technology reshapes markets and alters growth and distributional dynamics, Policies must ensure that markets remain inclusive and support wide access to the new opportunities for firms and workers. Across economies, there has been uneven participation in the new opportunities. Firms at the technological frontier have broken away from the rest, acquiring dominance in increasingly concentrated markets. Productivity growth in these firms has been strong, but it has stagnated or slowed in other firms, depressing aggregate productivity growth. Technology diffusion across firms has been weak. And increasing automation of low to middle skill tasks has shifted labor demand toward higher level skills, hurting wages and jobs at the uh, lower end of the uh, skill spectrum. Education and training have been lagging in the race with technology. With the new technologies favoring capital, winner-take-all business outcomes and higher level skills, the distribution of both capital and labor income is becoming more unequal and income is shifting from labor to capital. This should not cause despair, however. With more responsive policies, more productive and more inclusive outcomes from digital transformation are possible. The digital economy must be broadened to disseminate new technologies and productive opportunities to smaller firms and wider segments of the labor force. Uh, next slide, please. New thinking and adaptations are needed to realign policies and institutions with the digital economy. Policy needs and priorities, of course, differ across countries. But broadly, our research points to five areas that need more focused attention uh, from policymakers. First, Competition policy should be revamped for the digital age. Antitrust laws and enforcement should be strengthened. The digital economy poses new regulatory challenges that must be addressed, including issues surrounding the regulation of data. 
competition issues relating to digital platforms that have emerged as gatekeepers in the digital world. And market concentration resulting from tech giants that resemble natural or quasi-natural monopolies because of economies of scale and network effects associated with new technologies. As in product markets, policymakers need to ensure that financial markets remain sufficiently competitive and address regulatory challenges relating to the new world of digital financial products, platforms, and algorithms. Also, new frameworks are needed for international collaboration in areas such as regulation and taxation of uh, cross-border digital business. Second, the innovation ecosystem should be rebalanced. Aging pattern systems should be updated to the new innovation dynamics of the digital economy. They should better balance incumbent interests with the need to promote and disseminate technology more widely. Investment in research and development should be rebalanced by revitalizing declining public R&D programs to foster technological progress that serves uh, broader economic and social goals rather than the interests of narrow groups of investors. Incentives should be rebalanced by correcting biases in tax systems that favor capital relative to labor and push technology toward uh, what uh, Darren Asimoglu and Pasquale Restrepo call excessive automation, which destroys jobs without enhancing productivity. Third, the foundation of digital infrastructure must be strengthened through increased public investment and frameworks to encourage more private investment to improve digital access for underserved groups and areas. The digital divide remains particularly wide in developing economies. Stronger digital infrastructure and literacy will be crucial for these economies as technological change forces a shift away from growth models heavily reliant on low skill, low wage manufacturing. Fourth, Investment in education and training programs must be boosted and reoriented to emphasize skills that complement the new technologies. This will require innovation in the content, delivery, and financing of these programs, including new models of public-private partnerships. With the fast-changing demand for skills and growing need for upskilling, reskilling, and lifelong learning, the availability and quality of continuing education must be greatly scaled up. And persistent inequalities in access to education and training must be addressed. And fifth, labor market policies need to shift to a more forward-looking focus on improving workers' ability to move to new and better jobs rather than seeking to protect existing jobs being rendered obsolete by technology. Social protection systems covering social insurance and benefits uh, such as pensions and healthcare, which traditionally have been based on formal long-term employer-employee relationships, will need to adjust to a job market with more frequent job transitions and more diverse work arrangements including an expanding gig economy. How social contracts provide opportunity, risk sharing, and security needs to be rethought for the digital age. So to conclude, enabling broader participation of firms in the digital economy, widening the diffusion of new technologies, and building complementary capabilities in the workforce can deliver both stronger and more inclusive economic growth. 
Reforms in these areas can reduce inequality and economic insecurity more effectively than fiscal redistribution alone. In capturing the full promise of digital transformation, the growth and inclusion agendas are one and the same. Inevitably, major economic reform is politically complex. But one thing reform should not be paralyzed by is continued trite debates about conflicts between growth and inclusion. Research increasingly shows this to be a false dichotomy. Thank you, Jensen. I'm sorry, it's about this mute, uh, unmute. So this is the shifting paradigms. Is it the Korean case study? Okay. Uh, so looking at these issues, keyword growth and the jobs and equality in the digital transformation age from the perspective of Korea uh, provides uh, three excellent papers. Uh, things for all authors about it. Uh, two micro kind of very scientific analysis and the one is the, it's a macro perspective, a very ambitious and very uh, uh, well structured paper. Next, next slide, please. So the three part overview in the chapter summary and the remarks, and but I'll focus on the chapter summary, okay? Uh, because I have uh, two authors here, the Jung Soo Park and uh, Sang Won Chung at this panel. So uh, I guess that I hope to have uh, for the chances to uh, elaborate on this, the, what I introduced. So, so four chapters after this overview, uh, to which I contribute uh, just a little. And then chapter three is about these uh, technologies. And chapter six uh, is by Sangwon Chung, who is with us today, and Om Sang Min, uh, once an uh, ex KDI fellow, is now working at this, the university, organizing for digitalization at the form level. So, form level micro is the study. And lastly, the chapter eight is a very big picture study. And one of the most impressive study I've, I've seen these days and by my dear colleague, Jung Soo Park, the Seoul University, the technological change and inequality in Korea. Okay. Next slide, please. Again, okay. So chapter three, first is the, uh, is the theme already introduced by Jia. And this is the role of digital technologies and intangible at the assets as a driver of form productivity. So keyword is digital technology, intangible asset and form productivity. And this is the form uh, level micro database uh, produced in the new by this paper in the manufacturing and the service industries. Uh, and the main findings, uh, number one is the investment in digital technologies an intangible capital to make a strong contribution to the estimated total factor productivity, okay? which is uh, probably what you may expect. But this is one of the uh, few uh, micro level and uh, empirical the study using the farm level data. And second one is the complementary input, uh, just like as management practice, and combined with intangible and digital technology can boost and deliver the full potential of reform productivity. So hard technology and soft and the human technology, the manager level is very important. And now the third is about the divide between the large uh, leading companies and the smaller scale size SMEs. Uh, although the Korea, as you know uh, well, is a home to a very much a global level, very competitive high tech companies, the diffusion of and diffusion of the adoption of new technologies among SMEs has been pretty much weak. So limiting the gains from the digital transformation to so have larger and larger uh, this gap. So this is the kind of dual economic structure is, is getting, is becoming more conspicuous. And finally, successful promotion of technology diffusion in Korea uh, entails attention to diverse need of different size of forms 
instead of one size fits all solutions. Although Korea has made a good uh, effort and some success in uh, using in you know having more of uh, diverse and well developed policies, still you have this type of uh, tendency having just one uniform type of the policy. So this is a little bit of uh, what has it, I guess a sound chunk. Uh, could uh, elaborate on. So although the Korean government uh, subsidized the semi to install smart technology, smart you know, factory, and this uh, outcome has the uh, kind of limited, so only to find it underused. And so the government uh, effort to not only to introduce, but it's kind of disseminate and diffuse information on the use of digital technologies. Uh, many uh, fourth industrial revolution uh, general purpose technologies will prove essential. Uh, so next slide, please. So this is the chapter six. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is about uh, Mino Kim. And I'm uh, sorry, I confessed about you know, the, by Chong and Om. Um, uh, this is the, about this importance and uh, importance of worker human empowerment uh, and on the uh, factory, the firm, the firm level, not only at this formal education institutional level. So stepped up worker retraining and lifelong learning, LLL, using, and this is the Korean database on HR policy on firms adoption of new technological technology. So the main findings, number one, is a continuous learning, either OJT, the vocational education training, supported by forms itself, themselves, show a strong and positive relationship with technological adoption. And kind of very interesting and uh, maybe controversial, in fact, it finds that in contrast, uh, hiring the workers, hiring works with more formal education, like higher degree of education in the college and does not show a significant relation with technology adoption. So this is the continuous learning at this factory or the company level at this part, and not uh, this formal education itself, okay? That is uh, important for this uh, technology adoption. So naturally it concludes that intensive support for learning, the human empowerment uh, of the Form levels part is very much of a must and important, and to raise the productivity. And surely the role of institutions at the formal education, basic, the university, and the higher level will remain important, uh, but the role of the form as a teacher and the support of learning will grow. And just as gave uh, in Korea, this uh, human capital investment at the form level is pretty much limited compared to the other the country. So this is the area we need to focus on and emphasize more. So on the job training with the forms and deeper cooperation, uh, trilateral, tripartite uh, cooperation between government, educational institutions and forms uh, will be the key to spur overall this digital transformation. The last, okay, next slide, please. So this is the chapter eight by Chang Tzu, which I said is very, very ambitious and very, very uh, uh, thought uh, promoting, provoking, okay. This is the relation between analysis of technology and inequality dynamics. Um, inequality, this also, you know, associated with the disparity in Korea is very problematic and very much a trouble. And now the innovation of this paper is to use both macroeconomic and three micro, the form, the worker, and household level data. So this is a very much a, uh, well contrived and big picture analysis. Now, the main findings, number one is very, very uh, notable. Um, Contrary to some other studies, they show a declining labor income share in Korea in recent decades that Dr. Park uh, show the long run labor share appears relatively stable in Korea. The large self-employed sector in Korea is currently taking account. 
And for your reference, this, the share of the self employment sector is about 25 to 27% percent of the total employment. So this is the kind of outlier, uh, the big sector among this OECD country. And second is also very, very notable, is the wage disparity has increased over time due to wage gaps across the different size of form. This is the size of dual economic structure they start divide among the big leading companies and small, medium-sized, the rest. Okay. And surely this advantage the small forms left behind in terms of capacity, human capital, and everything, capital investment, and innovative activities, and technology, including technological adoption. And third is very, very uh, also important. Growing inequality is largely due to a persistent rise in the female labor participation, uh, which is uh, uh, still somewhat low compared to the other countries, about 40, 50, 4% to 55%, and thus increase the number of double income households. So this is the self-selection, the mating issue, which is very uh, interesting and must be seen well, closely from a kind of sociological uh, perspective. So policy recommendations, suggestions, as the uh, Professor Parks made, is uh, improvement in the business environment and First, SME had support, effective support. And second is to build that social safety net to make this ecosystem natural in and out of firms and the workers you know, more uh, in a desirable you know, or uh, quick the way okay, to support this type of firm level and the work level dynamics. And finally, refurbishing the redistribution policies more in the view of labor market participation and demographic transitions. So this is from the macro bigger perspective, not only can a small, the micro level kind of policy uh, designed, intended to uh, directly improve the redistribution. Um, so finally, let me give the conclude with uh, brief remarks. Next slide. Next slide, no? Okay, okay, <laughs> sorry, it's kind of. So here are many of the researches that are done in KDI and in Korea, but I just mentioned just the four. The one is the very uh, impressive, uh, impressive and very comprehensive study by OECD, the review of inclusive policy in Korea. Get OECD to commission the by KDI and the Korean government okay, published uh, one about one year ago. This is a good, uh, first of all, uh, foremost reference to have a better understanding of the Korean economy and the themes of these three chapters. And second is the done, the work done by myself. It's a comparative study on inclusive growth in eight countries. This is seven, you know, in European countries and Australia. And this five keyword for this is this growth, inequality, jobs, productivity, and well-being, by which they, I believe uh, exactly the same themes of uh, this uh, collaborative project. And third is the digital transformation in this Korean economy and society, volume one and two. Volume one and two is the case studies of Germany, Japan, and the United States. And volume one is the a compilation of the thematic uh, topical issues. And this has been published uh, in uh, about a year ago. And finally, combining all this, the what are the features and the strategy of Korea. And this is the conference held about just one month ago by Ministry of Finance and Economy and National Assembly of Future Institute and KDI. And unfortunately, except for the first volume of the threes, we have the Korean uh, text, co Korean report only. Uh, but someday, quickly, I hope that I bet that we'll have some of uh, this available in English to uh, share this perspective with all of you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Zia and uh, Chen Xing. Uh, thank you for 
completing your uh, presentation on time. We have several questions from the floor. Are we supposed to answer the questions now, or do we have time for discussion, discussion later on? Uh, yeah, uh, we uh, uh, will now move to the panel, and the, the moderator there can then uh, pick up some of the questions that are coming in. OK, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Good evening. Wherever you are following this uh, event, uh, let me first congratulate Zia and Chonsik uh, for putting together an excellent volume on probably the most important challenges of our times uh, covering technological change in different segments of our economies and thinking the roles of policies to play, to translate these technological changes into better growth and equity outcomes. Uh, the book offers a loaded agenda, however uh, you look at it. When I was reading the book, I was thinking, this is all about, of course, future growth. Uh, and to some extent, whether the 2020s could be the roaring 20s. As some of you know, there is this idea that you can look back to the 1918 Spanish flu and hope for a decade of rapid global growth after this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Reminiscent of these roaring 20s of that era. Uh, so uh, what happened during that period is that the building on technological breakthroughs in earlier decades, uh, North America and Europe, uh, enjoyed rapid modernization and strong economic growth in the 1920s. Automobiles replaced horse-drawn transportation, and they became widely utilized as improvements in assembly lines cut costs. Newly built uh, electrical grids paved the way for rapid industrial and household electrification. The economies of the United States, Japan, and some European countries became more productive. Global growth uh, that averaged 3.6% in the 1920s was double that of the preceding two decades. So now we have been witnessing a rapid technological change. So maybe we are on the verge of another roaring 20s. If we follow the prescriptions this book uh, presents. I will get back to this issue uh, later uh, in the session. Uh, we have an excellent panel to talk about a wide range of issues covering technology, productivity, uh, industry, and finance in light of the insights from the book. Uh, let me briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, Sankun Chang uh, is a research fellow uh, in the Department of Economic Policy and Strategy in KDI. Kiara Kuskiola, uh, head of uh, Productivity, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship Division in the OECD. Uh, Thomas Philippont, uh, Max Hein Professor of Finance uh, at Stern School of Business uh, at uh, New York University. And Martin Kaufman is Assistant Director uh, in the IMF. Uh, so uh, the game plan is very clear in the panel. I will ask the panelists two rounds of questions. In the first round, uh, my questions will cover the big picture problems. Uh, in the second round, uh, I will ask uh, policy responses uh, to basically address these big picture problems. I suggest uh, uh, panelists to keep uh, the responses under four minutes. So we will have time to collect some questions from our audience uh, after the first two rounds. Uh, there have been already some questions uh, coming. Let me start with Kiara. Uh, Kiara, for the book, you produced a very nice chapter on technology diffusion. Uh, we see stagnant productivity growth, in fact, weakening productivity growth uh, for an extended period of time around the world. Uh, what is the role of technology diffusion in these uh, weak productivity outcomes we have been seeing? Kier? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ayan. Indeed, I mean, the, the point that we try uh, to make in the book is the fact that technology diffusion can explain the global productivity uh, growth slowdown. Uh, and, and obviously there are uh, specificities uh, as uh, Cheon Sik rightly mentioned for specific countries like Korea. But we believe that uh, 
technology diffusion, especially uh, diffusion of digital technologies, uh, might not be as homogeneous as one might expect. And indeed, what we find is that uh, technology diffusion, which is a complex process, and it goes from invention to information about technologies, as, as Joseph was mentioning, to decision of adoption and, and to the effective use of these technologies, is very different across different firms, according to whether they have their endowed with the skills, with the complementary assets uh, that they need to, to benefit from, uh, from these, um, from these uh, technologies. And indeed, as you mentioned, it might be that the COVID-19 crisis uh, might make a process which normally takes a long time uh, finally, you no know, speed up. So it gave a push to technology adoption. Now, however, uh, while this might be spurring productivity growth, it might also increase the productivity performance divergence that we are already seeing uh, across firms. If what we see is that more tech savvy firms, for example, uh, are more likely to adopt more technology, more advanced technologies, and if anything, what we might see is that this divergence across firms uh, might actually increase uh, after, after COVID. So this is, I think, a point that is important to make, that especially in, in a digital world where uh, most of this development of technology is proprietary, uh, the role of policy uh, to allow, let's say, lagging firms to be able to absorb this knowledge and, and to access this knowledge is particularly important. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara. I'm going to get back to you on this uh, policy issues. Uh, one of the nice things about this book, it just uh, brings this uh, dimension uh, of uh, technological change in financial markets. Uh, Thomas Pilefon, uh, I think, wrote this wonderful piece uh, how digital transformation uh, affecting these markets, uh, the financial markets. Toma, uh, obviously, digitalization in financial markets bring huge benefits, uh, but there are some significant risks as well. Uh, in your chapter, you discuss these issues. What are the benefits and risks associated with digital innovations and technological transformations we see in financial markets? Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I think the basic problem is, uh, comes from what's wrong with finance um, in the first place. And broadly speaking, you can say finance is too expensive and that access to uh, good financial services is too uh, unequal. So I think that's the, 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 that's the starting point. Um, that is very true uh, around the world, is very true even in very advanced economy like the US. Uh, if you look over long periods of time, the, the cost of financial services has remained relatively high definitely higher than you would have hoped given uh, technological advances. And if you look at access to financial services, you see that it's still very skewed towards uh, upper middle class and rich households and uh, discrimination is still very prevalent. So that's the starting point. And now, uh, now comes FinTech. And um, it turns out that um, I think that there is really a uh, a very significant chance that fintech can help a lot in both dimensions. Um, fintech is going to is already bringing innovation uh, to finance. Um, by doing so, it's putting competitive pressure on incumbents. So, in pretty much every market where we saw significant uh, entry by fintech, we saw incumbents react by reducing their fees. And so, that means financial services are becoming cheaper thanks to uh, fintech, both because of innovation which can then be onboarded by big banks and because of sheer competitive pressure. Um, another part that I find absolutely fascinating uh, is the impact on discrimination. When I wrote the chapter, there were like maybe three or five papers that showed that fintech firms uh, do less, uh, engage in less uh, discrimination. Um, there was a very nice piece of research by uh, Ratna Sahe and uh, actually Yorkwit Dali IMF um, and, uh, and co-authors. And since then, I've seen another at least a half a dozen papers confirming in many countries, in Africa, in India, in the US, in Brazil, uh, the same thing, which is that algorithms do not discriminate as much as human beings. And so um, we, we already see the benefit there 
um, of fintech in lowering discrimination across uh, minority groups. So I think that's the, the big promise. And the big challenge is going to be um, how do we adapt the regulation uh, in real time so that uh, the, what is today really a promise of fintech can become uh, can be fulfilled. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Thomas. And, and uh, indeed, we see the uh, reduction in cost, and uh, I'm very uh, happy to hear there is also a reduction in discrimination associated the, the use of, of fintech when it comes to um, all types of things, uh, including, of course, the credit applications. Now, let me turn a little bit uh, about these uh, labor market issues. Um, and how to make sure firms are able to find a workforce uh, with the necessary human capital compatible with this uh, digital era. Uh, Sankun, uh, you have this very nice chapter in the book about how firms need to organize to take advantage of digitalization. Uh, and then you are using this Korean data, uh, a very rich uh, data. When we look around, we see that some firms do embrace these technological technology, uh, innovations quickly adopt them, but some others take a long time to adjust technological changes. My question to you, why do some firms become early adopters of new digital technologies while others wait and see? Uh, and what is the role of uh, firms' employment policies in the adoption of new technologies? Sanko? Uh, <clears throat> yes, hello uh, everyone, and thank you for having me today. Uh, so as you mentioned, uh, um, there's a significant heterogeneity in adopting digital technology across firms. And uh, I specifically looked at firms' internal organizational factor um, that is complementary with the digital technology adoption. So um, organization and technology uh, complementarity has been studied a lot in the literature. Uh, and you may think that uh, digital technologies in large part, just an upgraded version of uh, existing IT hardware software. And in that case, um, organizational uh, fitness with digital technology would be mostly the same with the fitness with uh, uh, information technologies. But I do think the, uh, digital technology is different from uh, the traditional information technology, especially in business strategy perspective, um, in the sense that digital technologies are mostly uh, used collectively and cross-functionally uh, to provide a new way of, of solving uh, business problems. Whereas uh, uh, traditional information technologies is functional and subordinate to the firm's already chosen business strategy. So, uh, and key here is it is the people who realize the digital technology can provide this kind of new business strategy and new ways of solving business problems. So I focused on um, how to manage people can be uh, significantly associated with uh, digital technology adoption. And uh, in the chapter, I find that um, the continuous learning within firm is one of the most significant uh, firm's characteristics that is uh, complementary with uh, digital technology adoption. And surprisingly, uh, I did not find that firms with just the more skilled workers uh, necessarily adopted this, these technologies faster, whereas uh, they tend to uh, adopt information technology. So interpretation uh, for that result is that uh, when technology is just used functionally and uh, independently as the uh, traditional information technology does uh, the preferred worker's skill is just the ability to understand and utilize uh, the existing technology well. But um, digital technology becomes, um, as I said, uh, it's different from IT when and only when it is used across functionally, collaboratively, and uh, extensively. So Good use of uh, digital technologies um, necessitates uh, workers' creativity, uh, communication skills, and adaptiveness. And I think this requires continuous learning uh, opportunity within firms. 
and may not be uh, simply obtained in the classes uh, at a university or colleges. Fascinating. I think that kind of the uh, main message is that it's not just a stock of knowledge. Uh, it's basically how that knowledge expands and the continuous learning is critical to basically facilitate adoption of technology. And, and uh, I find that result uh, quite interesting when I read the, your piece. I'm going to come back to you about the kind of the policies to foster technological adoption in, in firms and how that can be done through uh, the kind of the broader labor market educational policy options. But let me turn to Martin. Uh, Martin, uh, we covered quite a bit of ground here. Uh, we discussed uh, financial market, we discussed the broader technological change and uh, productivity, the technological diffusion, and we also uh, talked about, of course, labor market policies. Um, when we think about uh, advanced economies, especially, and already some emerging market economies, there's this, uh, uh, this uh, challenge of aging. Uh, of course, the aging societies are increasingly more prominent in many uh, countries. Uh, can you tell us your views uh, on the implications of this technological change in the context of uh, aging? Uh, thank you very much, Ayan, and thanks for inviting me to this uh, fantastic panel. And I have to say that I read the book and I think it's not just uh, quite impressive, but quite timely. And it's not timely, only timely for uh, the challenges that advanced economies are facing, but also for the challenges that developing and emerging economies are, are facing. So um, let me make two points. One is the challenges um, or what does di the digital economy means for uh, development strategies and second for challenges associated with aging and age societies that, as you said, it's not just a problem for um, uh, advanced economies. So on the first point, on, on what uh, uh, you know, digital technologies mean for development strategies, I think uh, if we step back in principle, um, digital technologies should be a force for good to accelerate growth in developing economies develop and emerging economies. Um, let me mention two points here. One is it could facilitate leapfrogging, and I think that can, can be uh, quite beneficial. And uh, two areas that you, we can quickly think of, one is access to finance. And we have seen a lot of examples where uh, significant segments of the population were unfinanced. And with FinTech, suddenly they become uh, they have access to finance. I think that can be uh, incredibly uh, beneficial. The second is information and communication technology, where, where again, significant segments of the population in developing and emerging markets where did not have access to, to, to these technologies and suddenly um, they have access to cell phones when they don't, didn't have a, a, a land phone, okay? A landline. So I think there are these elements that are very important to consider when, when thinking about the implications of development strategies. But let me add one more. And the other one is, um, I think uh, digital technologies can uh, lower barriers to trade. And I think that means that both small and medium-sized enterprises and uh, low and, and emerging economies can uh, you know, take greater advantage of uh, globalization and integration into, into the global economy. And I, I think this is an issue that we shouldn't, uh, 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 or we should consider uh, quite carefully. I'm not going to stop too much on the challenges that uh, developing economies will face because I think the book covers uh, uh, them very well, and we know that developing economies tend to have tended to have much uh, much more problems in terms of addressing those those structural reforms. Um, but maybe one area that I would like to highlight is that, particularly automation and digitalization. Uh, can render some of the uh, development strategies obsolete. And I think this is a, a very important point for uh, authorities in, in developing and, and emerging economies to, to consider. The, the picture I want a, a little bit of instill in your mind is that, is that when we started talking about data being the new oil, I think uh, uh, emerging economies and developing economies need to think differently. About, about their development strategies. So that's the first point about the, uh, the implications of the digital economy for development strategies. The second point is the point you mentioned. Unfortunately, aging and, and age societies are no longer 
uh, in the realm of advanced economies because many economies have become old or are becoming old before they are, they, they are rich. So then, you know, they will have really, really hard challenges ahead and, and transitional uh, challenges. So uh, to the extent that these um, digital technologies can, harness, can be harnessed by, by these emerging economies, I think, and to the extent that uh, uh, there is an increase in, in productivity, which is not a trivial thing, as we just heard from the panelists, uh, and, and there is an increase in, in, um, in, in, in growth and, and total fault productivity. The challenges of a lower you know, uh, labor force growth uh, can, can be uh, managed much better. Um, I think, uh, I think there, there, are, there are also elements where the digital uh, technologies can help maintain living standards, in fact, increase labor force participation because it can complement um, a, a, or, or help a, some older a, um, a people stay in the labor force a, for longer a, and also can transform critical services uh, in, in, in healthcare and medicine. So it can be, a, you know, digital, uh, the digital transformation can be also very, very important for um, you know, uh, developing and emerging economies that are fast aging. Last, and since um, you know, uh, I work at the IMF, I have to say that it's, it can be quite important in an aging society uh, to make sure that, that productivity and growth is kept up because um, it will, it will uh, uh, facilitate uh, the transitions associated with, with fiscal and pensions uh, sustainability, which can be really, really large and can be a huge burden to all of these economies. Let me stop here since I was told to be brief, but I'm happy to come back to this, to this point. Thank you. Well, indeed, uh, Martin, we are discussing these issues. Uh, uh, they, they have huge implications when we think about uh, fiscal policies, when we think about, of course, monetary policies, structural policies down the road and uh, aging, uh, uh, complicating the challenges associated with, with uh, all types of changes we see around, but at the same time, uh, bringing all types of benefits. So far, we have discussed the, the big picture problems. Uh, I would like now to turn to the uh, importance of policies and how policies can help address uh, some of these problems we have discussed. And I'm gonna start with Kiara again. Kiara, uh, you, you talk about the role of technology division, diffusion uh, and weakness. Uh, when we think about productivity, what are the main policies to improve, uh, you know, diffusion of productivity across firms, sectors, and countries uh, to promote productivity growth? Uh, uh, there is this idea that there's a lot of technological innovation, but we don't see that technological innovation, you know, translating into productivity growth at the aggregate, even though. There are some firms, they uh, register very large productivity gains as you documented in the chapter. Kira? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is uh, exactly uh, correct. Uh, as I said before, among most of the productivity advantage of these frontier firms, as we call them, comes very much from these complementary assets that are proprietary. So uh, there is a first role for policy uh, if, we if we want to make this productivity growth more inclusive, and, and as Zia said, you know, the two should go hand in hand, and, and there isn't really a paradox or, or an opposition there, is to really uh, make sure that these firms who are you know, more productive, more uh, digital, and that can really benefit, don't entrench themselves at the top. So here, for example, the role for an efficient IP policy for uh, transparency, uh, a role for when we think about, for example, the new oil, as Martin called it, you know, data, data transferability, data interoperability, really make sure that there is that competitive environment that Thomas uh, was mentioning was so important in the financial sector. This should be uh, the case everywhere. And in the same vein of really making sure that there is a competitive environment place continue to allow for uh, entrepreneurship and, and for new potential comers to really enter the market without facing 
not only the regulatory barrier, but also barriers that come from being too distant from this frontier. So uh, I would say this, let's make sure that there is no entrenchment at the top, and let's make sure that there is entry, if you want, at the bottom of, of this new plane. So that, that's the first, I would say, policy. In, in this big policy toolkit, the government should have. The second one is one that has been mentioned throughout, I think, uh, you know, from the intervention of uh, KDI president to, to the last uh, intervention by, by Martin and Surun, which is really the role of skills. Uh, in, in a digital uh, knowledge intensive uh, economy, as, as we all uh, face it today, where tacit knowledge is very important, one area where we really need to see uh, lagging firms being rich is skills, not only digital skills, but also all those skills that are very much complementary to digital technologies. This includes, you know, team playing, management, uh, you know, information sharing, and, and so on and so forth. So it's not just the STEM that we all uh, sort of focus on uh, normally. And this is, um, this is something that is particularly important if you want to make sure that there are no losers in, and, and there is a broad base gain uh, from, from digital adoption. So skill, skill policies, reallocation of, of resources as well is, is one where it's very important. And thirdly, as Toman and, and Martin mentioned, access to finance, uh, which especially in, a, in we are in a world where intangible assets are particularly important, but it's still hard to use them as collateral for small enterprises and, and for uh, startups. So that's where venture capital, different forms of, of financing are particularly important. And the last, and, and I would say uh, not least, the issue is one of openness, as, as Martin said. These investments to really be rewarding and have significant returns, they need to have scale. Uh, if there is no scale, you know, small firms, for small firms it's hard to, to invest, for example, in, in a digital uh, change because it requires organizational change, change in management and so on. So for this openness uh, is particularly important, both as I think in developed and, and developing economy. And that's where policy with industrial policy, trade policy can, can really make a difference. Uh, I, I'll stop here because I've gone through my four minutes, but I, I think you know there is a big toolkit, what I would like to say. And this is just, I would say, the point of the iceberg, the surface will go on for a while uh, on this. Thank you, Chiara. Uh, you really laid the ground, uh, uh, basically headline all the uh, big, I think, uh, policy interventions necessary in different realms. I'm going to, talk to turn to Toma uh, immediately. Uh, Toma, you talked about benefits and, and, and risks uh, associated with uh, fintech, how can policymakers improve the benefits of fintech while minimizing the risks associated with it? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I think uh, first we need to think about what's special uh, in finance. So, um, you know, I mean, if you think about fintech as innovative firms, uh, disruptive firms, then the definition of a, an innovative firm is that uh, it does not play by the old rules. And that's a definition of disruption. But that could mean two different things, depending on which rules you're talking about. It could be a technological rule, so they come up with better product quality or better ways of, or cheaper way to do stuff, or it could mean regulations. So in one case, we, we would say that's technological innovation. In other case, we would say it's regulatory arbitrage. Now, uh, so this tension between um, you know, uh, true innovation and regulatory arbitrage, to be clear, is true in every industry, right? If you look at, uh, uh, take something everybody knows, like Airbnb or Uber. Where are they successful? Well, it's a mixture of arbitrage and true innovation. So then you would say, well, then nothing is special in finance. But that's not quite right because finance has one particular feature, which is the regulations are particularly heavy, which means that, uh, and uh, I would argue some of the time for good reasons, some of the time for bad reasons. But uh, that's beside the point. Whatever the reason is, the regulations are heavy in finance. So what that means is that the reactive balance is shifted towards regulatory arbitrage. Because it's very regulated, there's a small scope for regulatory arbitrage. So I think the first thing to, re to recognize is that the um, uh, one challenge is to avoid regulatory arbitrage in finance. Now, how do we do that uh, without you know, killing innovation? So I think the obvious um, you know, strategy that's been used first in the UK, but then everybody's 
realized it was a good idea. So people started doing the same is the sandboxing. So sandboxing, uh, I don't know, people who don't know that I mean, playing in the sandbox like little kids. That means you let firms play in the sandbox with, without too many rules so that they can grow. Uh, and, and then, then when they graduate to being larger firms, then you start imposing the, the same rules or, or tighter rules, okay? So that is clearly the good, the good way to do it. Uh, I think there's a lot of learning by doing in, in that, in that uh, world. And uh, the, the tricky issue a little bit is how do you define exit from the sandbox? So when is a firm big enough that you want to impose on the firm all the burdens of existing regulations? Okay, so I think that's kind of point number one. Um, I think we know more or less the strategy, which is adapted sandboxing. The details are going to be tricky. And I think that uh, but I'm relatively optimistic because I think countries, uh, the UK took the lead. Um, I think people have learned from what they've done. I think there is kind of a framework there that has a chance uh, of working. Um, the second big issue is the one that's very connected to what Chiara just said, which is one danger of uh, uh, digital innovation in finance, just like in many other uh, sectors is the fact that um, some of the, many of the return to scale in finance happen at the firm level. Okay, so that's how they manage to give product for very cheap to everybody. Which, by the way, is one of the reasons that democratization is good uh, is, and is improving. Is because once uh, Vanguard figured out the way to do uh, um, robo advising, um, they do it because they want to do it for their big uh, clients not because they want to do that for the, the, the relatively poor people, but once they've done it, they can provide the same service, essentially zero marginal cost to poor people. Okay, so that's the great part. Now, of course, the flip side of it is, is that uh, because of the nature of this fixed cost, uh, that tends to lead to relatively high concentration on the, pro, on the, on the supply side. Okay, like the firms in, in digital, because of this effect tend to be relatively large. So the key, the key issue then is to uh, avoid excessive concentration um, in finance. There are many tools to do that. Some are common to other industries, so I won't mention them. The one that's specific to finance is the data part. So uh, it's not a cure for all, but I think that one thing policymakers need to do is to, have to be a bit proactive uh, and forward thinking um, <clears throat> with respect to data. So we know that the solution is going to look something like rules on data sharing and data ownership together with APIs, because the key thing is you want to force, you want to kind of embed in your regulation the fact that once you're big and successful and you have a lot of data, you need to have APIs uh, that are accessible. So APIs are like the, the interface, if you want, for other firms to access data from your system. And they have to be secure and everything. But that's the way to then allow entry by other firms, okay? So that you cannot just close your data and you. So I think the, um, uh, the key there in finance is, the, is that the intersection is that the intersection of data ownership and APIs. Um, so that's point number two. Um, and point number three, um, I think is the, um, the issue with algorithms and, and fraud. So uh, the regulation of algorithms is different from the regulation of human beings. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the case of actors who are kind of mostly benevolent, I don't think it's actually that tricky because if you think about the fundamentals of regulation, there's no reason to think it's harder to regulate an algorithm than a person and many reasons to think it's actually easier. The one place where it's tricky though, is that algorithms are becoming very, very smart and they are becoming very smart at exploiting behavioral biases in human beings, okay? Now the, to, be, to be fair though, humans, we are very good at doing it to themselves. So we have like 30 years of research showing essentially how much of asset management is fraud. Like they, they sell product to people who don't need them at high fees that need not be there. So that has been going on with human beings. So it's not as if the algorithm are gonna do much worse, but they're gonna get smarter. And by being smarter, they're gonna be very, potentially very able to exploit behavioral biases in humans. So, uh, and that's, and there, you know, in that, once you enter that realm, the, the distinction between uh, biases, bad advice and outright fraud is very great. It's all kind of the same. So uh, that's my one point of concern. I think it's, uh, I don't think it's like uh, the end of the world, but I think it's the one point of concern that we need to, to keep in mind. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Thomas. I think that uh, this new uh, frontier about uh, regulating algorithms is, is, is the most challenging when I think about uh, policies. Uh, Sankun, let me turn to you. Uh, how can policymakers help firms to adopt uh, technological changes uh, and make sure the overall workforce uh, have the skills to compete 
for this uh, new type of uh, technology intensive jobs? Uh, what can be done? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, first let me uh, first introduce a, uh, a famous book so-called uh, titled as the Second Machine Age is written by Briols and uh, McAfee. They argued in that book uh, there's uh, fears to lose our jobs in the digital era. But fortunately, human being is uh, uh, still better than machine in, in their terminology, idation. Uh, which means uh, coming up with uh, new ideas and concepts. So, <clears throat> so they argue that individuals uh, in the digital era need to uh, take advantage of skills of thinking outside box and government should then um, have a purpose to help individuals to improve the soft skills of ideation uh, by providing them better uh, education. Uh, and to do so, teachers need to be better paid and also schools need to develop well-designed curriculum, et cetera. Um, of course, I agree with that and it's important, but uh, one thing uh, I think the problem is the current formal, uh, formal education is lagging behind uh, industrial needs. Uh, it takes us uh, several years for example, for a university to, uh, to receive the demand and develop a proper curriculum uh, and teach students. Uh, and um, you know, given that the faster uh, technology changes, uh, the time lag may get bigger in the future. So um, that's why I emphasize the uh, lifelong learning and especially within firms. So uh, I think the role of manager in firms are uh, undervalued in the discussion of uh, lifelong learning um, because they mainly focus on the supplier side of the education, uh, mostly school or tech institution. I saw the uh, one comment in chat. Uh, there's also uh, formal education includes not only just the school, but uh, tech institutions as well. So uh, I think firms in uh, digital era can and also should be uh, the supplier of continuous learning. And I think government should also in incentivize the firms to do so. So one example in Korea, uh, let's say uh, we have a, such a, a, a government supported program called Main Bees, which is basically a, a program that evaluate how innovative a firm is uh, in its business management uh, and providing walkers a better learning environment um, is uh, one major part of that evaluation. So once firm is a certificate as innovative uh, and as a main business firm, it becomes eligible for several benefits, including uh, lower interest rate or uh, some export subsidies. So this kind of policy may help to incentivize firms, especially managers, to uh, encourage their workers to learn further uh, within or um, outside the firm. Um, and another policy can be uh, provide a business consulting um, to improve their management on employees' learning. And, um, and even this may be packaged with the uh, uh, support, the financial support for digital technology adoption itself. So, um, that could be uh, some kind of examples, I think. Thank you, Sanko. There is this one question, uh, and it's actually in the chat as well. I'm gonna ask you immediately. Uh, okay. There is probably a certain educational threshold uh, for minimal uh, tech literacy, uh, and uh, that that is necessary among workers to enable, facilitate, uh, you know, continuous learning and, and technology adoption. Uh, so there is still, you know, the kind of the very important role for uh, formal education, huh? Sure, sure. Yeah, of course. Um, um, there is a minimum technology requirement, um, a knowledge uh, to understand what is the new digital technology. How do we utilize these kind of technologies? What I argue is that um, those minimum technology knowledge, uh, tech uh, knowledge about minimum technology is not a uh, sufficient condition to adopt a uh, digital technology. 
may be a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. And especially in this fast changing technology environment, we need to try to continuously learn about um, not only uh, uh, technology itself, but also how to utilize the technology to come up with a, a new idea uh, in terms of business strategy. Excellent, thank you. So let me quickly turn to Martin. Martin, we covered the lot of ground uh, and, and uh, as Chiara mentioned, the kind of the trade issues. What's the role of international trade when we think about uh, technology adoption, the fusion, the kind of the, the cross-border uh, 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 trade of financial uh, services. If you can provide a brief answer, maybe around two minutes, uh, then, then uh, I'm thinking of uh, asking some other questions and taking questions from the floor. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, excellent question. I'll, I'll try to be uh, very brief. I think international co cooperation in general will be critical going forward in the digital economy. Uh, for all the reasons that the other panelists mentioned. I think um, negotiations to improve the multilateral trading system provide both um, uh, a good uh, visibility into what are gonna be the critical areas, but also the challenges, because these negotiations are very, very complicated. Let me give you, given the time, giving you four areas where I think this international uh, cooperation and negotiations will be critical. One is, as Chiara was saying, openness is, is, is really critical. Uh, it, it does, uh, uh, complement uh, uh, the, the need for sectoral shift and reallocation of resources from shrinking sectors to expanding sectors. If we don't have greater openness, that will be, be incredibly challenging. So that's number one. Number two, I think when you, we look at the frontier of trade policy, we see uh, certainly di digital trade, and I would argue also uh, services are uh, intrinsically linked to digital trade. Um, it, it's a key area. And where, what do we see there? We see, what we see there is that the importance of non-tariff barriers. So those are the ones that need to be tackled, which are uh, regulations uh, and, and other uh, uh, barriers that are quite intrinsic to this, including, for instance, market uh, access or, or investment controls, okay? So these are the areas that will need to be tackled um, importantly. Uh, third, we discuss data. And I think data flows. Cross-border data flows will be critical. Yes, there is a very important need to preserve privacy, security, uh, but also at the same time, the excessive control of data can be can lead to um, uh, not having enough open openness to to exploit the benefits of of the digital economy. Last, uh, I think uh, talking about competition policy to prevent concentration and, and dominance and, and foster contestability. Let me just finish by saying that trade is force most competition policy. So that's why I think openness is quite critical. So thank you very much. Let me stop here. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Martin. Uh, ultimately, we really need to make sure there is a rule-based uh, global trading system uh, functioning uh, in a way there is actually a uh, diffusion of technology across borders uh, and, and uh, all countries are able to take advantage of these uh, technological innovations in an equitable manner. So uh, we have only uh, five minutes left. Uh, the, uh, I would like to end the panel uh, with a kind of open question, uh, thinking that, uh, 10 years from now, this video is going to be available. Uh, we are gonna watch it, uh, uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but but uh, I, I would like to basically get your, uh, you know, impressions of the future based on uh, what we learned in this book and based on uh, the work you have done. Uh, the, I started the panel with this observation uh, about the roaring 20s. So we had the Spanish flu in 1918 that was followed with this incredible decade of prosperity uh, based on the technological advances in previous decades, actually. Here we are a century later, uh, we experienced unfortunately another pandemic in 2020, it's still with us. Uh, and thanks to incredible medical advances, we have very effective vaccines to cope with the virus. Uh, we just need to make sure uh, everyone everywhere 
getting vaccinated. Uh, prior to 1920, there were significant technological advances, and the 20s saw the benefits of these advances, 1920s. Uh, uh, here we are, we have seen incredible uh, technological changes, including these, of course, medical changes uh, over the past three decades. The question to every panelist, uh, are we on the verge of uh, roaring 2020s in terms of our economies and financial markets? If you say yes, uh, why? And if you say no, uh, why not? So I'm going to give one minute to each panelist uh, to make a prediction about the future. Uh, let's start with Kiara. Can I say maybe? Uh, I think policy has a big role to play. I think we have the tools and, and digitalization and the digital transformation is a great tool. I mean, it allowed a lot of resilience during COVID. We're all having this conference despite not being able to travel. So to me, uh, that's a very good sign. But it also entails a lot of risks and especially risks for equality and you know for fairness and for you know as, as some of the audience raised respect of privacy. So I think policy has a big role to play. We face also increasing you know global challenges such as climate change. Again, digital can be a great tool for that. But again, you know, we have a great opportunity with, with policies now, with the funding that governments have put in place, we need to use it well. So I think it will all depend on how well we will spend the funding that uh, has been put in, in the hands of government right now. Uh, thank you, Kiara. So Kiara said, maybe, uh, Thomas, what do you think? Are we on the verge of uh, an incredible decade of prosperity? No. I think that uh, oh, I think that uh, much of the much of the hype uh, around uh, digital technology is pure hype, um, especially for advanced economies. I would say something different for emerging markets, though. I think for them, yes. I think that um, so. My my best case scenario is that uh, the digit. So first of all, the true things that I find really amazing have nothing to do with digital, like. Uh, the new vaccines that we developed for COVID that has literally nothing to do with digital. Okay, um, it's pure. It's based on computing power and stuff like that. But that's stuff we had before. Okay, um, so I think that um, that's the one that's going to be very important for everyone. Um, the rest, I don't know. Like tech self-driving cars, we are years away still. It's just this thing is not working and is nowhere near going to be. I mean, if we have it for the highway within five years, we should all be happy. But that's about it. Okay. And everything else they said is not going to happen. So I don't buy it. So no, there, is, there will be no burst of growth for advanced economies. But my best case scenario is that actually, if we do it right, I do believe that digital uh, transformation can uh, speed up the catch up of uh, other countries. Um, and um, that can happen in many different ways. It could be sharing, better sharing, uh, better outsourcing, better integration of the global economy. There's stuff we can do now, thanks to digital technology, where we can um, we can trade. Essentially, one way to think about digital economy is you can trade stuff that you couldn't, couldn't trade before, especially in the service sector. So I think that should help catch up. That's great. That would also, by the way, indirectly boost the advanced economies. Um, and um, the other thing that uh, digital can do is allow um, some of the, again, a less advanced economy to leapfrog. Okay. So some of the stuff we, we do here with a uh, heavy handed uh, um, infrastructure you can leapfrog over that. Bank banking is an obvious one. I mean, many countries that don't have bank branches would probably not have many bank branches at all, and they won't need them. So that is leapfrogging, and I think that will actually boost the growth of lower-income in, uh, countries. Um, so, uh, so, but otherwise, no. And then on the downside, I do believe that uh, inequality is going to keep rising because of that, and I don't think that the way. I think that uh, if we are serious about it, uh, the big issue is education. And educational services are the most uh, backward, zero productivity growth, increasing costs that you can imagine, no entry, no competition. I think it's pretty close to a disaster. And uh, that is what we would need if we wanted to democratize uh, access to digital te uh, technologies in advanced economies. And I don't see that happening at all. Uh, so Toma painted a rather uh, pessimistic picture. Uh, Sankur, is there any reason to be optimistic uh, for the 2020s? Um, 
to be honest with you, uh, I'm not an expert on this issue. So uh, my quick and uh, my hopeful answer is uh, I hope so and hopefully. But <laughs> that's all I can say uh, for now. And uh, by the way, I, I saw one comment on in the chat. Um, someone asked to provide a link uh, in Korean agency that provide incentives in business to you know, innovate and provide firm training. I uh, I think they have a website, but uh, I don't think they have English website. So if you want to really uh, discuss about it, uh, please uh, personally contact me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Sankun. Uh, I think that the, uh, we need to find a way to make sure the policies of that institution uh, uh, are known by other uh, entities around the world. Uh, and and that, that will be one way of uh, diffusion of uh, policy. It's good policy, of course. Uh, but let me turn to Martin. Uh, Martin, you are uh, in the IMF. Uh, are there good reasons to be optimistic about 2020s? Um, yeah, I, I hope there are not the 20s that we saw before, because what follow in the 20s uh, is not good. But I mean, I mean, Kiara's come conditionally. Potentially, this can be uh, uh, harnessed. And I think that there are significant benefits. Uh, I agree with Thomas that, that emerging markets had uh, a lot to benefit from it. But I'm hopeful, but conditionally. Thank you. OK, so uh, the, the, what I see is that uh, there is uh, uh, hope. Uh, there is a bit of pessimism when you look at the data, actually. Uh, obviously, uh, potential growth has been slowing along with productivity growth. In all likelihood, uh, the estimation suggested potential growth will continue slowing down. Uh, this is something we discussed actually in the first book, uh, uh, KDI and Brookings put together uh, uh, under Zia's leadership. And if you look at uh, uh, consensus uh, growth forecasts over the long term, uh, those forecasts also suggest that um, growth is going to slow down. Uh, but um, uh, there is, I think, a hope if uh, policymakers do the right thing and uh, we see the kind of the type of transition uh, in economies uh, with, with the help of uh, policy interventions taking advantage of these uh, technologies. Uh, there are good reasons to be optimistic. And I think there are good reasons to be very cautious and, and think through these issues as Toma articulated very nicely. Uh, let me thank our panelists for joining uh, us today uh, for this discussion. I learned a lot. Uh, and let me thank Zia and uh, Chongsik uh, for inviting me to moderate this session uh, on their wonderful book. And uh, let me recommend to those uh, watching this session uh, to check the book. It has an excellent collection of data and critical analysis and policy insights. Uh, thank you again and hope to see everybody in person sooner than later. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Okay, I think we're uh, ready to move on to the uh, next panel. Um, and I see that our panelists are are live. Um, so I'm Danny Leipziger. I'm going to moderate this uh, second panel. We've uh, had a very uh, a good start. Uh, we heard uh, from the organizers of this very important book, uh, Zia and Chonsek, uh, uh, some of the overarching themes. Uh, we heard that digitalization has a lot of potential benefits. Uh, we heard from Zia that its diffusion has been uh, unequal. Uh, or uneven among firms, uh, that we've seen increased market concentration uh, and increased labor force uh, polarization. Uh, then he focused, as did uh, uh, Professor Philippon, on the uh, competition issue as being uh, rather key. Uh, from Chansik, we then heard that uh, in the case of Korea, small firms don't uh, benefit that much from these new technologies, that we also see a declining share for labor. Uh, and that we see increasing uh, wage disparities. Uh, so that's sort of the, uh, the overarching uh, uh, set of observations. 
the first panel I think uh, was was excellent, and I hope we can uh, do as well as they did. Uh, and I think we heard very much uh, that uh, you know there there are some uh, positive uh, possibilities, but that there's some uh, real uh, constraints uh, to making the best use of these uh, new technologies. Um, so my suggestion for this panel is that we uh, reverse the uh, intellectual order a little bit and start with, you know, what it is that about the Korean economy uh, that is uh, uh, problematic that can be either helped or worsened uh, through this uh, new age of uh, digital technology. So uh, let me begin by introducing our uh, distinguished panelists. Um, we have uh, three. Um, Harry Holzer is the John LaForge Professor of Public Policy at Georgetown University. He's the founding faculty director of Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality and the former chief economist at the Labor Department uh, and also involved with the Hamilton Project at Brookings. Uh, so I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Harry. Uh, our second panelist uh, was to be Francois Bougignon, as you know, uh, founding uh, president of the Paris School of Economics and former chief economist of the World Bank. But Francois has a uh, personal uh, reason why he cannot join us today, but he's very ably uh, represented by uh, Lucas Chancel, who is the co-director of the World Inequality Lab at the Paris School of Economics and a professor at Sciences Po, and a co-author of a number of important papers with Piketty, Saez, Zuckman, and others on inequality. So we have the labor market expert, we have a inequality expert. And third, we have Professor uh, Jung Soo Park uh, from Sogang University, uh, the director of the Nam Duk Woo Research Institute. Uh, for those of you uh, who are not uh, familiar with Korea, Nam Duk Woo was the leader of the Korea Trade uh, uh, Association that was behind the 60s and 70s great expansion in Korea's um, exports. Um, so Professor Park is an academic with a long background in uh, work on technology and productivity. So these are the, uh, the panelists that we, uh, we have. I'm uh, suggesting that we follow the uh, pattern of the first panel and uh, that we go through rounds of questions and that we ask for our distinguished panelists to limit their remarks to uh, four to five minutes uh, each. Uh, they've each produced a very uh, powerful chapter um, in the volume that I hope you will uh, all be able to read. Uh, and it's very difficult in a set of short interventions to uh, try and summarize uh, these very important chapters. So that's why I think the, the Q&A uh, kind of format may work uh, better. Uh, and I'm gonna ask each of you to, um, to hopefully uh, answer in four or five minutes what you think um, the book and your chapter and your research can uh, uh, help in terms of understanding better uh, what the benefits and uh, potential costs to Korea might be of the uh, digital age. Um, so let me uh, begin with, uh, with uh, Lucas. Um, and uh, I know that you and Francois have uh, worked together and know each other well, so I feel that uh, I can ask you this question. So Korea is a contradiction um, in a way since uh, it's inequality, income inequality uh, measures are quite good um, and uh, sort of in the same category as France. Um, yet its poverty rate is 16%. Uh, um, and so I'm wondering with this uh, new age of digitalization in progress, uh, how do you see inequality moving in Korea? Should we expect that it's going to get worse uh, from its currently fairly uh, good uh, position? So you know a lot about uh, what's happening in all these countries. So let me ask you, uh, Lucas, uh, to comment on what you think will happen with inequality uh, as a result of uh, digitalization. Thank you, Danny, for the introduction. Good morning, um, everyone. Um, perhaps first, uh, a, a little note. I'm here to, to, to replace Francois Bourguignon. And um, 
I myself just got COVID, so I was almost gonna get replaced, but uh, I felt that that would be, you know, too much of a cascade uh, of replacement. So I, I, I'll try to be here the best, uh, the best I can, despite uh, a little fever. Um, but all right, all right. So um, with respect to 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 the general topic here, I'd like to to thank. You know, Francois, for putting up this 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 chapter, which I really encourage everybody to to read. If uh, if 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 um, you didn't have the opportunity to do so far, and I very much uh, you know agree with the with the general lines that that um, Francois summarizes in this in this chapter, looking at the impact of. Um, automatization and digitalization, both on the distribution of earnings and the distribution of capital incomes. And I think it's it's important that we really look at these two dimensions. Um, you know, to me, the general way to think about, you know, what is going to be the impact of future dig digitalization on inequality in Korea and elsewhere is first to, you know, acknowledge um, this great diversity in inequality trajectories across advanced economies over the past 30 to 40 years. This diversity is observed when we look at um, disposable incomes. So after the operation of um, social insurance and redistribution mechanisms, in Korea, in France, in the US, etc. But it's also this diversity in inequality trajectory is also visible when, when you look at market incomes. Um, and I think this, this, is, this is very important because you know, many of these countries have, have been exposed in similar ways to automatization or to digitalization. So there are variations across countries, of course, but there are also very broad similar trends and we do observe this diversity and Danny was mentioning that, for instance, France or for instance, South Korea have, have been, you know, relatively resisting to this rise of, of inequality. Um, and what I want to say is that this is not just due to redistribution. This is not just due to the fact that some countries have, you know, developed uh, um, compensation mechanisms to to compensate potential losers from automatization, digitalization um, in 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 the realm of, of their disposable incomes. This is something that is happening before. This is something that is happening on the market, and um, of course, you know, this very general way to think about this relationship is the skill bias technical change. Uh, um, a framework and the you know golden and cats uh, um, race uh, between education and technology approach, where the supply for skills uh, did not uh, meet up the the, the supply for uh, the supply of, of new technology. Now, what I like to say here is that um, even though we do observe and. I think Francois, you know, points this out well in his chapter. We do observe that in countries where inequality rose very fast, we do observe a lesser um, supply of um, highly educated um, workers as compared to other countries. For instance, in the UK, there's, there's a, there was a faster rise, faster growth in college education in the UK versus the US, but you know, these differences are not that clear when you look at other European countries. And, you know, this differentiated growth in the supply of highly educated college uh, workers is not necessarily what is going to explain why France has resisted so far to the rise of inequality or to the rise of, you know, market income inequality. So a general message that I like to put forward here is that, um, you know, on top of the, the standard uh, skill bias technical change approach to these issues, it's important to perhaps introduce a, you know, wealthy biased institutional change approach or WBIC on top of the SBTC approach. That is, you know, 
what can explain the divergences across countries is also largely due to divergences in terms of tax policies, in ter terms of deregulation policies, in terms of how countries prioritized or not certain sectors of the economy, what choices were made in terms of um, revalorization or not of the minimum wage. For instance, in the US, the fact that the minimum wage today is 25% below in real terms, its value in the 1970s is not you know, particularly due to or directly due to effects related to uh, digitalization, automatization of the economy. The fact that this wage increased over the same period of time in France between the 1970s and today by a factor of four or five is not, you know, it's essentially due to institutional political choices. And so the answer to your question, Danny, is what is going to happen uh, to, to, to me, it's not, you know, necessarily going to be driven by the supply of technology, but essentially by the policy institutional responses to these technologies. And these really are going to fall in the domain of what type, type of tax policies are implemented, what types of regulatory policies are implemented, what type of minimum wage policies are we going to implement. So less about technology a lot about the supply of you know, skills and also a lot about how we ensure that uh, highly educated people get to good paying jobs, which is not necessarily a direct correlation. You can have a good education and a bad paying job if you don't have the institutional framework that is going to guarantee that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, we'll come back to the, the policy uh, uh, framework uh, questions, but I wanted to turn to uh, um, uh, Harry. Um, and uh, uh, I'm sure you know that uh, there's some peculiarities of the uh, Korean labor market uh, insofar as uh, they rely quite a bit on temporary workers um, and uh, university graduates are, have very high unemployment rates. Um, and there's a lot of part-time work, particularly among the elder poor. Um, so it's a weird, it's a, in, in my opinion, I'm not a labor economist, but I, I find it to be a, 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 a particularly odd labor market uh, compared to others. Um, and so I'm wondering uh, with this additional level of stress of disruption uh, that digitalization can bring with it, um, uh, what does your research show us that has worked in other countries and what do you think might happen uh, with respect to labor markets in Korea? Well, uh, thank you, Danny, uh, and good morning. Um, I must confess that I'm not an expert on the Korean labor market, but I can talk more generally about uh, industrial countries and especially the US. Uh, I, I focus my work very heavily on, on the US labor market and especially low wage workers. So I'll, let me put out at least some, some broad ideas uh, about ways of thinking about the automation challenges and, and a broad bucket of policies that I think would help not just in the US, but in many industrialized countries and in, in Korea as well. Um, I think the right way to think about automation and workers is that automation doesn't displace entire occupations, they displace the performance of specific tasks. Um, and, and the task focused uh, way of thinking about the labor market, I think is important because if for, for any group of workers, if, if the tasks being displaced are a small fraction of what these workers do, odds are there will be incentives for the firms as well as the workers to have retraining and, and get them to do other kinds of jobs. But if the tasks are a large fraction of what workers do, they are at a much higher risk of displacement. So what we want is to, is to train workers to be, to be able to perform tasks that are more complementary with the automation, not so substitutable. A lot of that is about education and training policy and more broadly ways to upgrade workers uh, so that workers share more uh, in the benefits of, of whatever productivity gains uh, the automation will produce. So let me put out some ideas and I, I hope they have some relevance to the Korean context. I believe they will. Um, and, and they're certainly relevant for other industrial countries. So in the realm of education and training, what can we do? to ensure that many or most workers are more complementary rather than substitutable by the automation, or at a minimum to prepare them to be retrained in a way that's complementary. Some, some of what's very relevant is the extent to which workers are trainable or retrainable. So the foundational skills that they get coming out of elementary and secondary education are very important. So first of all, I think 
elementary and secondary schools around the world must transition to a set of skills that some scholars call the 21st century skills, the kinds of skills that really are much more complementary. Uh, that's less about performing specific routine tasks. It's more about broader analytical thinking, critical thinking, and the, of course, the ability to make judgments. Um, uh, artificial intelligence, no time soon will be able to make complicated judgments of competing factors, uh, I think, in, in ways that, that humans will continue to be. Um, some of those skills, as you said, are critical thinking. Some of them are communication and teamwork based, and some of them actually are, are more creative. Uh, so these are all things that our education system could emphasize more. Secondly, firms could be incentivized to do a better job. And, and one of the speakers in the previous panel talked about these incentives. And, you know, as, as Zia pointed out, in America, some economists like Darren Asimoglu and, and, and Pasquale Restrepo think that our tax system has created a bias towards automation. We could try to fix that. I think some of those tax features are pretty well entrenched, but maybe we could have other things which re, that raise the costs of employers to displace workers and lower the costs of retraining those workers into a, a more complementary set of tasks. So one can imagine something like a, a worker displacement tax, not a robots tax, a tax on displacement to encourage firms when they implement automation to do it in a more worker-friendly fashion and subsidies for all kinds of on-the-job training, uh, tax credits, technical assistance, a broad range of things to encourage firms not to displace workers so much as to retrain them uh, for other jobs. And then thirdly, of course, for the workers who are displaced, we do need some kind of a system of lifelong learning. Uh, and those, those may be different in the Korean context than in the American context, but I can imagine things like lifelong worker training accounts. One can imagine um, uh, uh, withdrawing a little bit of each worker's payroll and investing it in an account that they can tap throughout their entire lives if they need retraining. Um, one could also imagine helping the training providers in America, the community colleges are the most important to provide more of this kind of uh, training in the high demand sectors to help workers get a good new set of skills to replace uh, the ones that they have lost. And, and of course, online education will feature prominently in this. We don't do a great job with online education and training right now, but we can get better and learn how to do it better. On top of education and training, let me just put out three broad ideas. And again, the specifics might vary from one country to the next. But first of all, at least in America, and I think this is true in most markets, employers actually have a fair amount of discretion about the quality. And this is also similar to what Lucas just said. Employers have discretion over what kinds of jobs they create and the extent to which they compete on the basis of very, very low labor costs, very low compensation, or whether they invest more in worker productivity, worker performance, uh, and, and with higher compensation the worker. Since the higher compensation the worker are a bit of a public good, I think public policy can do more to encourage employers to take what some people call the high road in compensation, to create good jobs, and, and to still be able to compete on that basis. So encouraging more good job creation, as a lot of jobs are wiped out and new ones are replaced, them, I think it can be very important. Secondly, some people will end up in lower wage jobs. That's just inevitable. Um, and I think a broad range of policies to make work pay, even in some of those low wage jobs, there's a variety. What we're talking about is various forms of wage subsidies, uh, various forms of subsidies for childcare and transportation and other things that are very important for what workers can do, uh, I think can do the trick. I agree with Lucas, by the way, that, that higher minimum wages can also play some role. I do worry a little more, I think, than Lucas does about uh, the loss of employment that could result if, for instance, if in America we had a federal $15 minimum wage, um, but we can, we can talk about that and what might be that kind of optimum level of minimum wage. And thirdly, now, I think this is very important. Workers need some form of voice in the workplace. In America, in the private sector, unions have almost completely disappeared. The rate of, of collective bargaining in the private sector in records down to 6%. Um, there's ways of pushing back against that, but there's also alternative mechanisms of, of worker voice. And the studies, by the way, show 
that when workers are unionized or firms that are unionized, the firms do implement the technology in a more worker-friendly way. And, and there are lower displacement rates from any automation that's implemented. So workers need some voice. Uh, and, and if it's not gonna be done through unions and collective bargaining, there are other models like, like uh, the works councils that many countries in, in Europe have for workers to have that voice. So there's a variety of things that we can do, somewhat on the education training job side, sometimes on the, on the job quality side and compensation side. Um, and and uh, we, we can talk about how to do those in the contexts of specific countries uh, and their legal and institutional frameworks. Thank you, thank you, Harry. Uh, well, there are a lot of uh, possible interventions, uh, and we can come back on those. But I wanted to get from Professor Park uh, his take on on some of these issues that you've heard um, in the previous session as well. Um, there are a lot of observations that uh, imply that uh, wage polarization is a is a problem. Inequality is a problem. Some of the productivity may not be. Uh, some of the technologies may not be productivity enhancing. Um, <clears throat> But a lot of it has to do with the industrial structure of a country. And so you better than anyone know <clears throat> the limitations, I would say, in Korea um, and the dominance of smaller firms and uh, et cetera that make some of the policy prescriptions harder to implement in Korea uh, and lead one perhaps to think that um, things might get worse before they get better, in other words, uh, the nice Gini coefficient that Korea currently uh, enjoys uh, may not uh, persist. So you've done so much work on productivity and technology. Let me turn to you. Okay. Thank you, Danny. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I learned a lot from uh, the panels here. Uh, good discussions and uh, uh, I agree with many opinions that uh, Harry and uh, Lucas has presented. Uh, first of all, you know, um, to your question, uh, it, what I have done in this chapter is, uh, I, I, I guess I realized it was too ambitious uh, than uh, what, what I could you know, uh, uh, swallow, but I had to do it uh, because I was so curious about what's happening in Korea. And um, one thing that uh, uh, you have to, we have to uh, consider in Korean economy, uh, versus other economies that Korea is, is very peculiar in the sense that there's a kind of a dual economy where, you know, as you said, industrial structure is very different. There's a very sm a small number of large firms, globally competitive firms, which is leading the country and uh, leading the value added. But with a smaller, uh, about 20% of the employment is uh, uh, represented in the large firm, whereas there's a large, huge dominance of small uh, SMEs, about 80% of the employment is in, the, in there, which is lagging behind low productivity and so forth. So we need to first take into account of the fact that we have this peculiar uh, structure, which is not present in any uh, other country. So what I wanted to do uh, in this chapter was uh, try to see you know, as the chapter uh, title is how technological change is having impact on the inequality, uh, I need to, I wanted to make an, uh, an, a connection. What is a channel of this technical change as a macroeconomic perspective? Uh, first, first of all, um, the, it was really difficult to um, link and to identify uh, uh, quantifiable var variables to uh, link these to a very, large topic, you know, technological change and inequality. But what I had to do is, uh, what I did in this chapter was uh, seeing that Korea, in Korea, what you have talked about in digital transformation, automation, actually happens in, usually in the global large firms. Whereas in the small SMEs, it's not, it's really rare to have rare, uh, it, it, there's a rare, for, rare number, a small number of firms adopting, you know, doing this uh, DT, digital transformation. So um, uh, one thing that um, uh, I wanted to look into was that uh, whether these um, technological change, uh, these highly uh, creative and uh, highly, you know, high capacity uh, large firms, whether when, uh, what you have talked about in this panel is, uh, it's all happening in that section. It's all happening in that section. And uh, the macro impact 
may not be uh, um, what what's happening in, in that session may not be represented in, in the macroeconomic perspective. What I'm saying is because they have a very small number of employment proportion in these large firms, uh, even if the automation you know uh, happens, it may not appear in, in, in the macroeconomic uh, variables, uh, and that's what I found in uh, in this um, uh, in this uh, analysis. First of all. Uh, first of all, what I found in Korea was that, um, first of all, we thought, you know, the labor income share in most other countries has been declining because of, we thought that, you know, in other countries because of technology, new technology. But in Korea, we've, when I measured it, labor share, income share has been very relatively stable. Okay, so um, I have to look into more into what's happening behind this thing, you know, why, you know, why is not declining. But my guess is that uh, it may be because of what Harry has told, uh, said. It, it may be because that uh, there's, a, there's a unskilled and skilled, and skilled, which is complementary to the new technology, is benefiting from this technological change. And they're compensating more for these, uh, in, the, in that case. So maybe you know, it's benefiting the skilled. So the sum of the labor share may be, uh, it could be stable. So what that meant was, uh, it, it's leading to wage disparity. And that's the next uh, data set that, that I looked into. And I found uh, in the wage survey and also the uh, business survey. And when I looked at, and also um, I found that the wage disparity has been increasing overall in, in Korea. Uh, <laughs> but recently it has been slowing, slowing down. You know, wage disparity has increased up to, for example, 2010. And after 2010, disparity has been relatively stable and mildly increasing. And then what I wanted to do was link this wage disparity because it's individual data with the household data. You know, uh, I've, I've, I saw the, the chatting <laughs> window and there are lots of misunderstanding there because, uh, it, it, you know, you have to look at, look at the book, read the book to find out uh, what, I, what I analyze. Anyway, to link the weight, because the, the difference between the wage disparity and the household income is the household income, there could be multiple income, right? There could be single income base and the household in, uh, double income base. So what I found was between, between <clears throat> mid 1990s and the 2000, mid up to 2000, wage disparity actually contributed to higher uh, household income inequality. But overall, all period, you know, after 2005 onward, <clears throat> actually wage disparity has a very small contribution to the household income inequality. But overall, um, overall, uh, what you know, uh, uh, Dr. Wu has, you know, he has presented in, in the previous slide was that female labor participation has increased. I'm not trying to say, you know, uh, uh, we need to cure that. What I'm saying is Korea is under development stage. So it's a very natural thing that the female la labor participation is rising. And we have to accept because of these uh, uh, single income based household transforming to double income household families, we are experiencing some rise in the income inequality, which is very natural. And we think that once it get, gets stabilized, I, will, I, I'm, I expect that the income inequality will fall because when every, you know, Many of the female has many of the household is double income. Then it will be more equal. So we have to realize what's happening and why. Uh, then um, you know produce uh, you know policy prescription. We cannot blame everything for you know uh, it, it, this is because of technological change. There are some portion of inequalities which is attributable to natural consequences of development. Uh, so. In that sense, you know, I want to, you know, I want to make it clear that to the audience that uh, you, you're, um, there's some misunderstanding about my findings. And um, uh, about, you know, uh, income inequality, uh, Danny, you told me, you, you said uh, Korea has a very good, you know, uh, uh, what a low income inequality, but in Korea, we, we think it's very high. You know, we, we always emphasize that we have a too, too high in, in income inequality. So we, it's a, one of the top priority in this country to, we want to solve. So um, I, 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 I said too much, so I'll stop here. Okay. No, thank you. You've said quite a lot. Uh, we'll maybe come back on the female labor force participation uh, mm -hmm. issue, which is 
complicated. I understand the context in which you you find that it, um, it, it double income households, um, uh, you know, have an impact. But um, obviously, as you said yourself, that's the policy prescription is not uh, is not to reduce uh, female labor force participation. Uh, quite the contrary, given demographics uh, of Korea. Um, so we'll come back to uh, some of these issues, but I wanted to uh, go to the second round. And um, uh, Lucas, if you uh, if your COVID uh, is not kicked in further in the last few minutes, um, I wanted to ask you the following uh, more general question about uh, income inequality. And, and I would have asked Francois, but I can ask you because you're both French. Um, when you look at the OECD data, you see that uh, France's income inequality is, is not very good prior to transfers and taxes. Um, and then after redistribution, um, which goes a little contrary to what you said before that, you know, you worry more about market uh, incomes rather than the, the uh, final disposable incomes. But anyway, um, but, but France makes a big effort. You know, the difference in, between the two genies is, is enormous. Whereas for Korea, similar to the US, but the US distribution is worse. Uh, there's not that much change, uh, you know, the, between uh, pre and post tax uh, and, dis and transfers. Um, so one implication for that could be uh, that uh, uh, Korea has more space uh, to do uh, further uh, work on the tax and redistribution uh, side, particularly if uh, income disparities uh, start to uh, to to rise. Um, so I wanted to link that up with this concept of the basic uh, universal income, which I'm sure is something that you know a lot about. Um, is that something that Korea might consider? And what has been the experience in some countries? And obviously, you only have a couple of minutes to to respond to that. But um, uh, is is that a possible way for Korea to think about things going forward? Because um, uh, I think we probably will see a, a rise in inequality in Korea. Um, you haven't found it yet, Professor Park, but it's going to, I think it's coming. Uh, so the question is what policy prescriptions can you uh, look at that have worked elsewhere? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Danny. Um, so, first point on the um, on the understanding of the situation, and here, I, yeah, I like to challenge a bit this this standard OECD view that, you know, France or Europe in general managed to really uh, keep inequality in check thanks to uh, a big, um, strong redistribution uh, from pre-tax to post-tax incomes. In fact, so we have this paper with uh, my colleagues Blanchet and and Guetin, uh in the American Economic Journal, uh, the title is Why is Europe More Equal Than the US? And in fact, we basically, we show that essentially things are happening on market income uh, distribution. And a country like the US actually is going to have a more overall progressive system of taxes and transfers. But the problem is than, than European countries and then France, the problem is that it's way too unequal to start with the United States. And so why the misunderstanding to start with between what we show, which comes from uh, the distributional national accounts methodology, where we really try to distribute the totality of national income to individuals and what the OECD statistics here that you mentioned uh, reveal. Um, a part of the answer is that um, OECD statistics don't really have this granularity at the very top of the distribution. So they tend to see a bit less inequality in countries like the US because of the data sources used. But perhaps a more fundamental point here is that in European countries, um, you know, a big part of the pension systems are socialized pension systems are not, are not capitalized pension systems. Meaning that when you look at market incomes, there's a lot of uh, very poor people in uh, um, European societies because uh, their market incomes are zero and before uh, redistribution. So sometimes what these metrics that you that, that I think you, you're referring to, Danny, uh, tell us is, is basically that Europeans have or French have, you know, uh, uh, um, collective pension systems uh, that go through state redistribution and other countries don't. 
but they don't really inform us about uh, the dynamics within the distribution of earnings of the workers. So that was the first point. Now, the second point, universal basic incomes or other systems. Well, you know, UBI, I think, you know, can be something that is, you know, in principle interesting, but um, sometimes, you know, if it's proposed as a measure that is going to be a substitute to other forms of, you know, social support, um, um, health insurance, or, uh, you know, all the types of support that Harry was referring to before in terms of, you know, helping people accessing transportation, accessing other forms of, of uh, you know, of basic goods that they need to access to is not necessarily the right way to go forward. Uh, that, so in countries like Germany or France, you have, you know, these minimum incomes for people that are outside of the, of the labor market and that, you know, they don't have a, an employment insurance schemes anymore. And I think that, you know, this should be generalized to basically everybody in society. And this, is, this would be very close to UBI, but making, you know, UBI as the, you know, key solution to automation is not necessarily the way to go. And here, I, I really would like to, you know, come back to what Harry was saying about, um, you know, education, you know, lifelong education. And I'd like to connect this, and that will be my final word, with minimum wage. Basically, um, in a country like France, for instance, where you have basically uh, governments are bound to increase minimum wage every year. And, you know, this contributes to make sure that, you know, you know, bottom part of the distribution sees their wage increase. And I think it's it can also be seen as an incentive for governments to make sure that the supply for high skill education is on par with this increase in minimum wage. So it's also an incentive to go further in terms of your supply of good education that is fit to the current technological uh, um, setup. And this is not what you observe in other countries. So I, I think in terms of, you know, this ecosystem of both educational policies, minimum wage policies, and finally tax policies. And I think uh, François Bourguignon in his paper sees four roles for tax policies influence the pace and direction of innovation. We've discussed this very rapidly with, with Harry before, you know, but also to finance this access to, to education and to finance these safety nets. And, and, and Francois sees also other roles for, for taxation. I leave that for further discussion in the interest of time. No, thank you very much. I feel like we uh, we have both you and Francois, so we got two for one here. Uh, so thanks very much for that uh, intervention. Let me come back to um, uh, to Harry on the education. Um, you know, uh, I don't think you can go to any one of these panels, uh, and ours is no different, and the one before is no different, without hearing that the answer uh, lies in uh, lifelong learning. Um, it, it lies in uh, learning different skills, and you correctly identified a lot of that. Um, isn't, uh, you know, the, the traditional measure that countries use to uh, see how they're doing, uh, the old PISA um, uh, tests, um, uh, don't seem to be testing uh, what you and others have said is important uh, in terms of uh, the skills that workers need. Uh, to be adaptable and to adjust to new technologies. Um, so would you be in favor of changing those, those uh, PISA metrics? Because, uh, you know, a lot of countries, including Korea, do very well on those. Um, but uh, you could also argue that uh, uh, what's being measured is not necessarily uh, the skills that the 21st century worker uh, will need. So this link between uh, labor market outcomes um, and education, I think is sort of key and you're the right person to tell us about that. Um, well, well, thank you. Um, so a couple of things about that. Uh, yeah, first of all, the PISA test is for children um, and it, it's designed to measure these ge very general foundational skills. I think it does a decent job with that, but, but, but it may need some, some updating in terms of these more 21st century skills that, that will be in fact more complementary uh, to, to work uh, and to automation. Um, so 
it might involve updating PISA, but there is, of course, a, a second test called the PIAC test, uh, P-I-A-A-C. It's also uh, uh, distributed to uh, OECD countries, uh, and it's more aimed at adults uh, and what they do on their jobs. So, so the PIAC test is a nice complement to the old uh, PISA test, and I think that will improve our understanding. Uh, but there's also a, a, a literature uh, that has been developing on the tasks that are necessary to be performed uh, in various kinds of occupations, the extent to which automation replaces those tasks. Um, and, and we have, you know, sometimes that literature is, is backward looking, looking at the extent to which robots have replaced blue collar manufacturing workers or in other contexts. Sometimes it is more forward looking. Um, and, and I do want to cite the work of, of a young economist named Michael Webb, uh, who has used these data on, on tasks to try to estimate what artificial intelligence will mean in terms of future displacement, which might be very different from the robotics of the past or the automation of the past. And there's at least the possibility. Webb's work finds this, maybe, maybe some others disagree. Webb, Webb believes that, that a much wider range of occupations will now see task displacement. It'll go much higher up into the uh, education and skill distribution, possibly into the realm of professionals, doctors, lawyers, financial analysts, uh, accountants, et cetera, because the, the more routine parts of their work will now be done increasingly by artificial uh, intelligence. Um, but, I, but I think that's also, in, in addition to the tests, to updating the tests, I think it's important to pay attention to that kinds of work uh, and, and to get a, a, a better sense of where the automation will proceed quickly, what kinds of tasks it will replace, and what, how that will affect the distribution. Uh, of, of future task performance and work. I do believe that there will remain a skill bias uh, in, in this sense, because I think that when professionals, if people like us face some task displacement by automation, we will have a better sense of how to pivot quickly towards new task performance um, th than a lot of less educated workers. So I think a lot of what we've said in the previous rounds, there, it will still con continue to be uh, inequality enhancing, and we'll have to pay attention about that. And let me just make one final comment about, about UBI, since that was one of the issues from the table. I have not been a fan of universal basic income. I think it's very, very important to keep these workers in the labor force, and that's why I prefer make work pay policies, wage subsidy types of policies, rather than a universal base. I've updated my thinking a little bit in the American context, because I think children do need some kind of a universal basic income. Um, and, and of course, in, in the United States, at least for 2021, we had a new child tax credit where the parents of every single child get some kind of tax credit to keep them, to make sure their children live at, at a sort of a universal basic income level. So I, I, I prefer that form rather than a broad-based US uh, UBI. I, I, I think we all, all these countries need policies to make work pay, to make the market based incomes more equal, uh, and one way or the other to encourage workers to stay attached to the labor force. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, uh, move now back to uh, uh, Jung Su and ask you uh, two uh, very difficult questions. Um, and uh, one has, well, the premise is basically that, uh, as most of you know, Korea faces a presidential election in March. Uh, and I don't know, uh, you know, what the outcome will be and what policies the two major candidates are espousing. Uh, but they're coming back to the lifelong learning question. Um, since I think the data is roughly that 20 percent of um, Korean uh, labor is temporary workers, um, which makes lifelong er uh, learning even more difficult if you want it to be firm based. Of course, if you take uh, Larry's idea of uh, some sort of a, a national account uh, that you draw on, uh, that would make uh, life easier. But again, in the Korean context, uh, uh, more complicated uh, because of uh, the, the workforce. And also, um, you know, the proportion of elderly that are poor or fall below the poverty line is alarming for an OECD country. Um, and the previous administration, or the current administration in Korea has tried through uh, a number of means, some of them counterproductive, like raising the minimum wage, which displaced a lot of elder workers in their temporary jobs. Um, 
So maybe what Lucas suggested that there be some sort of um, minimum incomes, at least for uh, the elderly, um, uh, so it doesn't displace work, it, but it, it provides a safety net that is more, um, uh, you know, uh, important for, for, for the elderly. And as you said, some countries in Europe have this. Um, so this is a roundabout way of throwing a few things at you to say, okay, so now I've made you the, the new uh, advisor in the Blue House for the new administration, <laughs> whoever wins. Uh, what can you do uh, to fix problems and to prevent some inequality issues or disparity issues from getting worse? I would first decline the, your offer. <laughs> <Can't believe. laughs> it's uh, it's going to be really, really difficult to solve. And I think you know everyone, you know either party, either party, you know whether you're in the right or left, uh, we are recognizing we have we are facing a really in, in, this inequality problem, and it's getting worse. Uh, but first of all, you know, first fact uh, I need to, I want to clarify, if you look at the recent Korean data about the re redistribution rate, you know, the market income inequality and the uh, after tax inequality, yeah. uh, it then measures increasing really rapidly. That means uh, the market income inequality has been mildly rising in the recent years, but actually the the after tax, the uh, dis uh, disposable income uh, inequality has fallen in the last five years. So, and the gap is exactly what you're talking about, Danny, about the, uh, we are giving a lot of money to the elderly people, you know, the very disadvantaged people focusing on, uh, we have a system which is giving a huge, uh, you know, we are increasing that portion as you have recommended. So that's kicking in because more and more proportion of the population is becoming older and automatically the redistribution factor is uh, getting stronger, stronger. Uh, now, going back to Lucas, I'm sorry about in Korea, we have a, you know, there are candidates uh, trying to promote the UBI, you know, but UBI, you know, I, I, you know if, if it's um, manageable, I think it's, you can do it, but I think uh, we are at the stage about 30,000 uh, 30, per cap, capita income. At our stage, it's going to be very difficult financially in a fiscal policy because, uh, you know, and so what we wanted to do is uh, concentrate all this money into the very poor uh, class and the disadvantaged uh, uh, workers or the disadvantaged elderly people. And I think that that would be a more um, uh, appropriate way to approach inequality and also the education and all that. Also, uh, I think both candidates are agreeing on uh, mm -hmm. In, uh, what, uh, enhancing education uh, system and, and so forth. Okay, I, I don't know if that's going to be a good answer. But... No, no, it's a very good answer, but I should also say that since you're the only Korean academic that we have on our panel, uh -huh. um, in terms of uh, um, uh, what it is that university graduates need to have in terms of skills, uh, do you see any change in the curriculum and the way things are being okay. taught? Because University graduates, you know, the un unemployment rate is whatever, 10 to 15 percent. So um, the question is, is it on the supply side or is it on the demand side uh, or, or obviously probably some think, of each? Yeah, I think it's both sides. You know, uh, first of all, uh, in Korea, there's a huge, tremendous change in curriculum, you know, uh, uh, and they're responding to the industry demand about, you know, AI, machine learning and the, the DTI, DT and the even in, in our university, we're developing all these uh, programs. And I don't know whether it's going to be effective or not, but we're trying at least. Uh, so that would be, that, there's a, a tremendous change, uh, very, um, uh, but on, I'm, my worry is that even, even if we train all these uh, college graduates with the AIs and you know, all these new technology, will there be enough jobs out there? Because uh, I don't, no, you know, given that, uh, you know, we have uh, only small number of globally competitive firms, I don't think they're going to absorb all these people. So wh what we are trying to target is startups, uh, trying to, you know, startups mm -hmm. to um, make new businesses and, all, uh, and to absorb these new train, uh, uh, new technology train people into these startups and ventures and, you know, uh, and firm growth and, and so forth. So there is a, a ongoing change in Korea. Uh, hopefully uh, we have a good uh, 
you know, result. <laughs> well, that's encouraging. Um, I think the startups is the right place to go, but of course it relates back to the previous panel in terms of competition policy and uh, structure of industry, et cetera. Um, I'm reminded uh, on your observation on the demand side that uh, as I recall, something like 200,000 university graduates take the uh, exam to be Samsung uh, intake, yeah. and only 2,000 are, are accepted. So 99% right, right, right. don't make it. <laughs> so exactly. that's a problem exactly. on the demand side. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Uh, we need more more good firms, you know, more large firms. You know Samsung and LG, but we need more of the, those like uh, advanced countries. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. Okay, um, let me uh, wind up. We're a little bit over, but I think we were starting a little bit late. Uh, let me uh, ask each of you if there's uh, one minute uh, that you would like to add one more thing that you thought of or that you uh, want our listeners to, um, uh, to walk away with. Um, and then we will uh, uh, close up uh, hopefully by 10.10. Uh, uh, Lucas, uh, let me start with you. Thanks, Danny. Not much to add, except perhaps from the the, the fact um, um, that I think it's really important to to perhaps on the research side pay a little more attention to this to this vast diversity of of inequality, you know, post tax and pre tax inequality trends across countries, and we have not yet fully uh, gotten the, the the wealth of information and of uh, potentially policy relevant conclusions uh, coming from a, a better understanding of these diversity when we look at digitalization and automatization. Mm -hmm. No, thank you very much. And I, I, um, I must confess that I take the OECD data at face value and haven't dug into it the way, uh, the way you did. So uh, that was very much appreciated. And let me also thank you very much for stepping in for Francois um, and, and uh, we appreciate that. Uh, and we hope your, your COVID illness passes uh, quickly. Um, uh, Harry, can I uh, turn to you? Any uh, last minute uh, thoughts that you wanna share with, with the audience? Well, to be very brief, I'll just say one thing. Um, uh, it is clear that automation will have a wide range of effects uh, and therefore it will require a wide range of, of, of adaptive strategies, both on the part of workers and firms uh, and the government. There will be no single silver bullet. Some of this is about education and training. Some of this is about finding other ways uh, to be supportive of workers, uh, whether they're displaced or not, whether they face more competition. So let's look at that broad package, education training, plus other things that address some of the inequalities that Lucas has talked about and that Jung Su has talked about as well. It will be a package of responses, not a single silver bullet. I think that's very uh, good admonition. And I think uh, it's one of the conclusions of this panel is that there are a wide range of policy areas that need to be addressed uh, if one wants to deal with um, with this issue. Um, Jung Su, last word. Yeah. Oh, sure well, I said to... You sure you don't want to go to the Blue House? I mean, I think you'd be great there. <laughs> no, thank you. I'll recommend you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, I thank you so much for, I. Uh, it's a re really beneficial for me. And uh, what I wanted to say is that, um, you know, we have micro evidence and we have some episode, uh, episodical evidences, but I want, I, I, looking at all these macro data and these uh, comprehensive data, what I found was we have to be really cautious about just, you know, jumping into conclusion, you know, linking micro evidence into just macro evidence. It doesn't work in some cases like Korea because Korea has undergoing a lot of transformation and it would be very hard to identify one, you know, micro evidence as the key, uh, you know, driver of macro changes. So I just want to be, uh, to make a comment that we need to have a correct diagnosis to get the correct policy description in order to that to do that I think we need to be cautious about you know um, looking at the data I think we need more uh, we, we have to be com uh, look at the more comprehensive data and more analysis before jumping into conclusion well thank you I'm just looking in the chat box where uh, we uh, were remiss and not uh, uh, coming back on some of the uh, questions. Um, I think uh, 
clearly the the issue of uh, uh, women in the labor force is one that yeah. I think requires a little further uh, discussion in terms of uh, wage gaps and uh, um, and and other issues that uh, affect uh, uh, women. And I think, given Korea's demographics, uh, getting more women into the labor force is definitely what you want to do. Uh, and if there's some second order impact that can be dealt with through other policies, but I think the main intervention should right. be to uh, pr make it easier for women to uh, be in the labor force, to come back into the labor force. Um, and uh, and I, I note that, uh, you know, Korea always looks at Japan and uh, Japan's actual labor force participation rate for women now is, is higher than uh, Korea's. Um, so you're the, the worst in the OECD. So that needs, uh, that needs some attention by the new administration. So when you get to the Blue House, please take care of that. <laughs> um, so let me thank our panelists uh, for a very uh, spirited conversation. I think a very practical uh, set of policy observations. Uh, I think admonitions to be more careful in looking at the data, uh, market incomes, disposable incomes, and also looking at a, at a wide range of policy interventions that can affect income disparities uh, obviously, just you know, disruptive technologies will persist. The question is how governments uh, deal with them um, in areas where there are uh, market failures, externalities, regulatory issues, competition policy issues. Um, so that's why I think the the consensus view of the panel that there's a wide range of policy interventions that can be uh, brought to bear uh, is important. Um, so let me end by saying that I think this uh, second volume by Brookings and the KDI has uh, added a lot to our understanding of issues and to uh, uh, understanding better what Korea faces and can uh, face in the future, uh, looking at experiences from other countries and bringing you know, top-notch scholars, uh, both from the KDI as well as uh, from uh, other universities uh, into this uh, project. And so I think uh, I can close by telling Zia and uh, Chonsik that they've done a wonderful job. And uh, hopefully uh, uh, the panels um, will also uh, have added uh, to what people need to do, which is to buy the book and read it. So um, good night in Korea and um, good afternoon in Europe and uh, late good morning to everybody here. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.